Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming out on, on a Saturday um, to our event. Um, so this is an event we had an idea of to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the original National Scarf, the Scottish Archaeological Research Framework, the website being launched um, back in 2012. And for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Helen Spencer, and I'm the current Scottish Archaeological Research Framework Project Manager. Um, Jen, over there by the <laughs> registration desk, is, is our um, project officer as well. So if you need anything during the day, please come and, please come and find one of us. So of course, this isn't the 10th anniversary of the project starting. Um, as we'll hear this morning, um, the idea for the project germinated back some four or five years earlier. And the original national scarf was a number of years in the making. But it was in June 2012 um, that the um, scarf website, um, as it used to be, became available on its old home at scottishheritagehub.com. And then at the start of 2013, there was a more formal launch by the then um, Secretary of State um, Fiona Hislop. So the day is going to be split um, into three sections. We're going to be talking about the past, the present, and the future. So the first session will talk about the birth of the project from the original idea, um, the idea of a project to create a national research framework, and then the following project to add the first new thematic framework, future thinking on carved stones in Scotland, um, to the SCARF resource. The second session is about the present, and we'll be hearing from some of our recently completed and current projects, in particular the regional research frameworks, and from the perspective of different people in different parts of the sector who've been involved in these projects. And then we'll be back after lunch to talk about the future of SCARF. So I'll be giving an update on some of the projects already in the planning for the next few years, and there'll be talks about projects that have just got underway. So as we are, or that we are hoping to start in 2023. And we will also be explaining about some of the new technical advances coming to SCARF um, very, very soon. And these include the development of a new website that will bring all the UK research frameworks together in one place. And then we'll also have some news about how research questions um, from our frameworks will be linked to the new Oasis 5 that will be launching in Scotland very soon. And then again, we'll have time at the end of the day for more general discussion, and I'll have a few sort of prompts to hopefully generate some discussion about where SCARF could and should go in the future, so for the next 10 years. So to move on to the day ahead, uh, like I said, the first part of the day is looking back. So many of you in this room were involved in the original SCARF project and probably know much more about it than I do. So I didn't join the SCARF project until around 2018. So I'm leaving all the talk of the past to those who are heavily involved in it at the time. And we have a number of perspectives um, from people who were involved in the project at the start. So first of all, we have the director of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland talking about how, how the idea came to be and how the project got off the ground. And then we have Jeff Saunders also from the Society, our current um, Digit project manager, um, talking about the actual project and the development of the project and how it was all worked um, back at the time. And then a perspective from Diana Murray um, on her role um, and the project from a, a member of the steering group's perspective. And then finally, rounding off the morning, we'll have Sally Foster um, talking about the future thinking on carved stone um, um, in Scotland research framework project. So first of all, I'd like to in introduce um, Dr. Simon Gilmore, who's the director of the Society of Antiques of Scotland. And he was involved, like I said, along with many others, um, from day one, um, coming up with the idea of a national research framework for Scotland. And he's going to talk to us about looking back with the original idea and concept of SCARF and how the project got started. Thank you, Helen. Good morning, everyone. And I'd just like to add my welcome to everyone who's turned up. It's fantastic to see so many of you here. Um, I've got notes because I didn't want to miss out some uh, important names and things like that um, in my uh, discussion. But um, I hope you'll uh, join with me in uh, celebrating 10 years since the launch of SCARF. But as uh, Helen said, the story actually starts five years earlier, in 2007. So um, I had just been appointed director of the society, and um, with a desire to ensure the society was at the center of heritage work in Scotland. And I'll leave you to debate how successful that's been. Um, but SCARF certainly was crucial to help deliver on that thought. So discussions um, prior to me becoming 
director, and indeed that early period of being a director, um, Eve, uh, had made clear to me, certainly, a need, uh, a wish to develop uh, archaeological research in general in Scotland. Uh, and uh, that sort of made clear in this quote right from the very beginning from a, a background paper that was uh, written in 2007 about SCARF, then called the National Archaeological Research Framework. So how did SCARF come about? Right, well, 2007, let's travel back in time. 2007, who remembers 2007, 2008? Does anyone remember what's going on then? Got some nods, some, yeah, no. <coughs> Brendan, what was going on in 2007, you remember? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was a very different place, but also strangely the same as it is today. Um, while I was trying to get my head around um, what the society did, how it did it, um, and trying to bring the organization uh, to become a 21st century organization, uh, making it more accessible, modernizing um, its uh, policies and activities. Um, the idea of the society being a sort of central, uh, having a central role in enhancing research in Scotland also started to, to form. And um, on this image, you see um, there's the website for the society when I um, started and then we, we revised it in 2008. Um, and even that now looks incredibly clunky and old and it's, yeah, but it's interesting when you look back. Um, in 2008, um, also, I, I got married and had my first child, moved house, decided to start a new job, all really good fun. Enjoyed every second of it. But <clears throat> things, were, uh, things happened in 2007 that actually did impact on um, how we viewed archaeology and uh, what we were doing then as well. So things were thrown into stark relief late 2007 when we began to realize what the banks had been doing with our money. And the world was gripped in a global financial crisis. Things looked bleak. There would be, as a result, uh, a real squeeze on the public purse to help pay for the eye-watering bailouts provided to the banking sector to help keep them afloat. Does any of this sound familiar? This is, it's almost, yeah, history repeating itself already and we're only 15 years on. Um, so that was a, a, a part of the context of, of, of thinking about SCARF, and I'll come on to why in a minute. But also in the archaeological world, um, lots of people are already considering the future of archaeological research. Um, and indeed, uh, there were some small-scale uh, frameworks and research or, or research agenda being created and being developed or indeed being talked about. Um, and since uh, you know, my personal research interest of, is the Iron Age, I knew about the uh, Understanding the British Iron Age and Agenda for Action, published in 2001, which had its infamous black holes, um, many of which were in Scotland. Um, and we were thinking, scratching our heads, you know, how do we fill these black holes? What are we going to do um, to address some of the issues that were uh, in, the, in these agenda? But also, um, and very specifically, actually, I think uh, Ireland um, was working on things like uh, an, a Royal Irish Academy um, report which was talking about the future of archaeology in, Scot uh, in Ireland. Uh, archaeology 2020 um, was um, published in 2005, not, not, not long before, um, which was uh, again looking at the future and, and did talk about uh, research agenda or frameworks for the island, I, 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 island of Ireland. So we thought, you know, how do we fill those black holes in, the, in, in, in our research, but also uh, how do we tie the various disparate projects that had been gotten off the ground. So we've got uh, the West of Scotland Research Agenda, which was mainly through museums uh, run by, uh, uh, in sort of Glasgow area, the Clyde area. Uh, Discover Butte Landscape Project had started up and was um, uh, doing a sort of whole scale landscape review of Butte. Um, and uh, there was a historic rural settlement research and management framework in the discussion. I don't know whether that actually got off the ground or where that went. I don't know if anybody in the audience knows anything about it? No, I think it may have just disappeared off the face of the planet, unfortunately. But <clears throat> our answer to this question came, as most good things should, over lunch. Roger Mercer um, was the president of the society at the time, and he and I had a rather long lunch one day, somewhere around here, but I can't exactly remember where. Um, 
and there was a fair amount of wine drunk at this particular meal. We chatted widely over various issues or possibilities for the society, but one thing we kept coming back to was the Discovery Programme in Ireland. And for those of you who don't know the Discovery Programme, it was set up in 1991 by the then Taoiseach uh, Charles Hockey, and our late honorary uh, fellow George Egan was a major driving force behind it. It was conducting large-scale desk-based and field surveys in Ireland. It was um, undertaking excavations uh, on sort of thematic and geographically located priorities. Roger, at that point, I think, was on the board of the Discovery Programme, and I was familiar with its work through my PhD, um, and particularly the Western Stoats Forts project, which the um, Discovery Programme was running. And also a colleague in um, Arkham's, where I used to work, had got a job there just a few years earlier. So we knew about the Discovery Programme, and we wondered, and we pondered, and we thought, could the society perhaps start a similar project in Scotland, government-funded, doing major survey and excavations across the country. We soon realized that that was very unlikely. Um, as we've already noted, the financial context was against us. Uh, there was already uh, excellent excavation and survey work being carried out. And such a program would necessarily mean, at least in those days, participation restricted to a relative few, uh, few people, few research subjects, few locations across Scotland, basically two view voices being heard. So, and besides, <laughs> now they're asking, where would we start? I mean, obviously, I wanted to go and dig brochs. That was clear. I mean, obviously, that was the clear point we should all start from. Roger disagreed, felt the Bronze Age deserved more attention. So right from the very outset, you know, there's always going to be attention in trying to decide, you know, what would your priority be? So from the outset, and then by the end of this meal, um, we realized that what we wanted was something that everyone could be involved in, that everyone got a say in, and that reached across the whole sector for answers to the question, what should we research? And something that everyone could access and they could use it as they wished. So rather than undertake research itself, the society would provide the foundations and the inspiration for research and would, due to its independent status, and that was an important point at the time, and still remains so today, I believe, provide a safe and welcoming environment in which to discuss and debate Scotland's story. In short, we wanted collaboration and open access. And this was the first written vision for what is then known as the National Archaeological Research Framework. And it would guide us through the next months and years of blood, sweat, and tears, some of which you'll hear about today. But how to turn this vision into reality? Well, first we had uh, better define what we actually wanted. Uh, and we did this, but no, by no means perfectly. Uh, this is um, the sort of uh, initial sort of group of people who helped us out with the, uh, the initial project. What we um, wanted was a framework. We knew we wanted a framework, not an agenda, not a program of projects, but a peer-reviewed and co-produced framework. And this would provide understanding, it would highlight gaps in our knowledge, and it would then be up to others whether they wish to use that information to help guide their own research. To succeed, therefore, it would require buy-in from across the sector. And the other aspect that we, that we did um, agree on was that it should be iterative. So it should change as new research filled gaps and produce new questions. And this meant that it, had, it in, in concept, had to be a long-term project. So, actually, I'll go back to that one just now. Next, we needed cash. The society had some resources, but this would require more. And following the discovery program, we turned to government. Uh, discovery programs funded by the Heritage Council uh, in, um, in Ireland. And Historic Scotland was the government uh, at that point. Roger and I met with Malcolm Cooper, then Chief Inspector of Ancient Monuments at Historic Scotland, when both things existed again, over lunch, and outlined our vision. And somewhat to our surprise, Malcolm immediately saw the benefits to Historic Scotland, especially in terms of making research more efficient and getting more bang for every public buck. And I suspect that a certain Noel Foyot um, had um, prepared Malcolm for that discussion, but we'll come to that. We made an application for funding in late 2007, and through the good offices of Noel Foyot, we were awarded 180,000 for a five-year project. I don't think you get five-year projects these days, but that was um, 
uh, an absolutely fantastic start to the thing, to the project. Riding on a wave of enthusiasm, we brought together the first steering group meeting of key people in the sector, trying to cover about cover as many of the different interest, areas of interest as possible, and I'm sure you hear more about this later from Diana. Uh, they met on a cold day in January 2008 at RCAMS, and Roger, in his own inimitable way, uh, brought everyone together to help support and deliver the project. And we swiftly then moved on to um, advertising for a project manager post. Uh, we uh, received about eight to nine applications, we interviewed four or five people, and it came down to a choice between two and we ended up with Jeff. And we still have Jeff, much to my amusement. <laughs> or delight. My many attempts to try and get rid of Jeff have failed over the many years. We still have him 15 years later, and you'll hear about it uh, later, uh, next. So, um, while much of the form of scarf was defined through the process of creating it, and I still maintain, and I think somebody said it already this morning, that it is the very process of creating and maintaining any research framework that is the most important part of it. It is the bringing together of people um, that actually is the important part, not the final product itself, although that obviously has its benefits. We had to start somewhere. And looking back now, I wonder exactly what it was we were thinking when we put things together like chronometrics. No idea at the moment what chronometrics might have meant, but I guess actually thinking back now, over the last 15 years, we've had developments in both dendrochronology, we've had developments in uh, wiggle matching and things, so maybe that was the sort of thing that was at the back of our minds, but um, certainly that was uh, uh, a sort of an aspect actually that we never did pursue uh, as a thematic aim of uh, SCARF. You'll hear uh, more about these developments. Uh, from others today, but uh, I wanted to highlight one aspect that we learned quickly and uh, one early disagreement. So we quickly realized that panel discussions often got stuck discussing what could or couldn't be done, rather than what they wanted to be done. And most of these sticking points revolved around what we called, or we ended up calling, systemic challenges. And while SCARF wasn't initially set up to address these, we began a file on them. And uh, what basically happened was we tried to take them out of SCARF and deal with them in other fora, in other areas. And the society agitated to address them in different um, locations in the sector. So um, it's one of the reasons why we end up with a Scottish archaeology strategy, for example, which now helps to address some of these systemic challenges that we, we recognized even then. This helped SCARF to remain focused on the story, on the questions that needed asked, and on the research and the aspirations for the sector. The disagreement? Well, Roger, bless his soul, wanted a book. And we differed on that. I did not want a book. And he instead, therefore, suggested a large lever arch file. <laughs> the contents of which could be swapped out as required when research questions were answered and our understanding changed. So basically, the concept was that everyone who wanted one would get this lever arch file of SCARF. Right? And then every now and again, the society would periodically send out new pages as SCARF was updated, and you would swap out your pages and you would maintain your uh, lever arch file of, of SCARF. I'm so glad we did not go down that route. So with initial support from Historic Scotland and in-kind support from other key institutions and individuals, SCARF was born. And it quickly grew support across the sector and beyond. And I am and always will be grateful to those who work and worked for SCARF, especially all those hundreds of people, I mean literally hundreds of people, who have given their time and continue to give their time and knowledge freely to ensure that Scottish Archaeological Research Framework is leading light in archaeology, not just here, but out with Scotland too. And I just want to point out that things have come full circle. So as we celebrate 10 years of SCARF launch today, we're presently, as we speak, working with the Discovery Programme to help them deliver a research framework for the island of Ireland. The end. Yep, thank you very much, Simon.
excellent. Yeah, and then, so next I'd like to introduce Jeff. So as Simon said, was the lucky person who got to manage the SCARF project <laughs> um, throughout. So he's going to reflect on um, the experience of managing, project managing the original SCARF project. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, it's really nice to see you all. Uh, my name's Jeff, for those of you who have not met yet. Um, and I was the original, um, the first uh, SCARF project manager. Now, can I ask you all to cast your mind back to 2008? the International Year of the Potato. <laughs> now, as Simon said, 2008 was actually quite a tough year, um, but I'll always look back fondly on the Year of the Potato because that was the year I was appointed as the SCARF um, project manager. And funnily enough, when I was thinking about this talk, it reminded me of my job interview, um, squeezed into one of the small um, rooms in the society offices. I was actually faced with quite the group um, there was my boss, my current boss, Simon. Uh, there was Roger Mercer. There was Diana Murray. And there was Noel Foyut. And actually, they're all sitting here. This is almost, <laughs> oh my god, it's almost a rerun. Um, um, and I, I remember it so clearly because the, the sun was quite low. The blinds weren't quite shut. And so I had a, a shaft of light cutting across my eyes as though it was some kind of weird interrogation tactic. Um, uh, but I, I survived it. But it was actually something of a recurring theme in that throughout SCARF, I got to be in rooms and work with people who previously I'd only ever seen like on the, 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 their name on the side of a book or talking at a, um, a conference or being the author of a, a policy paper. Um, it, was a real, um, it was a real benefit for me personally to actually get to spend so much time with these folk who had kind of been blazing a trail in archaeology um, for, for so long. Um, the first order of business I had um, when I was appointed in April uh, 2008 was a change of title. Um, originally, as Simon had mentioned, um, it was going to be the Scottish National Archaeological Research Framework. We wanted to change that for various different reasons, not least because the acronym for that is SNARF. Um, and I don't know if anyone watched um, Thundercats when they were kids or as adults, obviously no judgment, um, but there's a really particularly annoy annoying character in that cartoon series. So we changed it to the Scottish Archaeological Research Framework, which was lucky because there are only about two or three thousand other organizations with that acronym. Um, my my favorite one being the Samoyed Club of America Education and Research Foundation. Um, and I was actually quite pleasantly surprised to look back on their website and see like how much they'd grown, you know, in the time uh, uh, with us. Uh, the second order um, of business for me was to begin work with the steering group. Um, and Simon kind of put up the, the membership of the steering group um, earlier. Um, and it was chaired by um, Roger Mercer. And here he is kind of in his element, um, glass in hand, chatting to folk at the, at the SCARF launch. And one of the things I like about this photograph is the more I look at it, the more people I see in the background of like, oh yeah, they, they worked on SCARF, they did some stuff. Peter McKeague is there, like just them, yeah, hidden away at the back. It's kind of like a game of name the archeologist. Um, the steering group was very high powered, like um, my job interview times, well, literally my job interview times four. Um, they were all the folk at the kind of the, the top of various organizations in, um, in Scottish uh, archeology. span um, and they were, it was particularly intimidating as a kind of like a newbie, you know, as, as a, a green archaeologist coming into, um, into all of this. And um, we had some really big names, um, again, ones that I'd read about as a, um, as a, as a student. Um, there were a lot of them. It was about 12 people. Um, it was a very male group. I think Diana and Julie were the only women there. Um, so as a group, it was quite hard to kind of harness all of that, you know, in the individual steering group meetings. But as individuals, working with them as individuals, it was hugely effective. And kind of it, it, the thing that I reflect on most was just what a cool, fun job I had. I had access to all the people right at the top of archaeology who could open any door I needed. Um, if I needed staff support, um, if I needed a resource, if I needed anything, you know, they could make it, um, uh, they could make it happen. My first day at SCARF, um, I traveled up to Aberdeenshire and got driven around Aberdeenshire with um, Ian Shepherd just chatting about what he thought about Scottish archaeology now and how it could be improved and seeing some um, kind of amazing um, uh, sites. Um, also, if I came across a, a challenge or a question or a query, I had this huge font of knowledge. Did I know anything about Bronze Age metalwork? No, but I could just 
speak to Brendan O'Connor. He was treasurer at the time, so he was, he was often in the office. Did I know anything about um, the medieval period in Scotland? No, but I could phone up Steve Driscoll. It was a complete um, kind of like wonderland looking, uh, looking back on it, you know, um, with, with, the, with that kind of like gap of, of years since I've been involved with SCARF. I got to travel all over Scotland and see some of the coolest places by the people who knew them um, uh, best. Um, I worked very closely with Roger to kind of navigate all aspects of, um, of, of, of SCARF. And I can't kind of quite overstate his um, influence and impact on making all of that happen. Um, it was kind of, it was a real um, privilege to work with him, even if um, the man's vocabulary was incredible. I found myself using words like Firth, um, you know, on a daily basis after kind of spending time with him. Um, and he was in many ways both quite old school, but also really cutting edge, you know, in the kind of the nicest way. Thinking of, of Roger then, I actually wanted to ask you all um, a question that I think he would have approved of. Um, are there any people, are there any medievalists or people interested in medieval Scotland in the room? Good, there are a few. That's not the question, by the way. <laughs> um, what I would like, I, I think you guys might have a bit of an advantage or possibly a disadvantage in this. Can I get you to imagine um, Scotland in AD 1000? And here to help you is a screenshot of an imagining of uh, Scotland AD 1000. I like the angry shouting bit at the bottom. Um, this is from the, uh, the Disney 90s cartoon Gargoyles, um, which I'd completely forgotten, but actually, yeah, it's partly set um, around about this time. And um, what I'm gonna ask you is about uh, demography and population levels. Um, and around about this time then, um, I, I'm trying to get a sense of how many people were living in Scotland in total, you know, at that arbitrary date. Um, and I've put together the, the, the kind of the made-up number of about 500,000. And I'm wanting to get a sense from you and you at home. I'm not quite sure how that will work, but we'll find out um, whether or not you think that's about right, whether that's, it should be way lower, 400,000 or less, or it should be way higher, 600,000 or more. So I was going to do this by show of hands. So can I ask, is 500,000 about right, do you think? Were there about half a million people living in the entirety of Scotland in AD 1000? Any takers? Feel a bit like Bruce Forsyth now. Lower, lower, lower than 500,000. Okay, good. We're starting to get a few people who think less. And, and greater, 600,000 plus. <laughs> It's a, it's a, yeah, um, it's, I actually asked that question with the same number um, ahead of every SCARF workshop we did um, with every period um, panel, you know, just using the same number. And it was really interesting because there was always a complete split in terms of what people voted for. And I think that was one of the real eye-openers for me for SCARF was just how we take for granted certain fundamentals that underlie our narratives, things like demographics. And we had some complete huge ranges when we're talking about, say, um, a prehistoric population or a, a, even a modern population, kind of thinking about how many people um, were, were kind of active there. And it bleeds into everything, including like terms like farming. You know, th these things were things that we could really explore and unpack um, uh, uh, through, through SCARF. Um, it also reminds me to read Dave Cowley's PhD, because I think he's, he actually tackles it kind of like head on. Um, on to the panels then. Um, this is a distribution map. You probably um, can't quite see the, the, the text, I'm afraid. Um, it was a distribution of all the sites mentioned in the Paleolithic and uh, Mesolithic SCARF report. And I think it's really interesting. One of the things that I think is of value looking back is to see just how much that kind of map would change if we were talking about the Paleolithic um, and Mesolithic today. Try as we might, um, myself and the steering group, we couldn't really figure out a better way to divide up um, the panels than chronological. Um, we tried to keep the panels broad, we tried to keep them overlapping, and we had a couple of panels, Marina Maritime and Science and Scottish Archaeology, to try and kind of work cross period and pick up um, kind of <laughs> recurring themes. Uh, the steering group identified a couple of people to um, co-chair each panel, um, and the co-chairs were left with the task of actually assembling the panels um, getting people in to write different um, sections of the report, discussing the issues, speaking at, um, at workshops, and interacting with a kind of a much wider sphere of critical friends um, who also gave comment, wrote sections, um, and we also employed early career archaeologists to undertake specific pieces of work 
uh, that the panel's kind of identified as important. Um, I should stay, say at the outset, the co-chairs did loads of work, um, and I got to know them all really well, and hopefully as friends, uh, rather than mortal enemies, but I wouldn't blame them. <laughs> um, but it, was a, it was quite an intensive process. Um, all in all, it was a lot of people producing a lot of work primarily for free. Um, we started with a medieval panel. Uh, feel free to cheer if the medieval period is your favorite period. Yeah, there we go. Um, chaired, by, uh, chaired by Mark Hall. <laughs> chaired by Mark Hall and Neil Price. Um, and this was actually the first, the first panel we had. And we hosted the first meeting in the then historic Scotland building, uh, Longmore House. And I wore a suit and tie and never again, because I think most of the panel thought I was some kind of like government agent. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it soon picked up um, after that, and actually I ended up loving the, the medieval period. It was a period I knew nothing about um, uh, 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 at the start. Um, the Paleolithic and Mesolithic panel, again, please just, just cheer if you like. Um, the, yeah, there we go. Uh, the, the Paleolithic had recently been discovered in Scotland, um, which was quite handy. Um, and it was chaired by Alan Saville and Caroline Wickham-Jones, who are both sadly um, uh, no longer with us. Uh, the Neolithic panel, uh, which was chaired by Kenny Bofi and Alison Sheridan, Alison's over there, yay. Hey, thank you. Um, that was probably the one I was most starstruck by in that I'd studied this um, a, a period. And this was also the first period that um, people tried to poach people from that period. Um, Alison was definitely one of those people who other panels kept, kept on trying to kind of lasso and, um, and drag into their periods. Um, we had a, a Calcolithic and Bronze Age panel chaired by Jane Downs on her own, which seemed kind of unfair. But I think um, at the time, everyone thought there wasn't much in the Bronze Age. But around about 2008 was kind of when everything was becoming sucked into the Bronze Age. You know, hill fort dates um, at one end, um, henges, whatever they are, you know, at the other. Um, so Jane had to do a kind of a power of work. We had a modern panel, um, which had a huge remit and was chaired by Chris Dalgleish and um, Sarah Tarlow. And I was completely starstruck by having uh, Sarah there. I was a huge fan of her work. And they had to grapple with a modern period and not divide it into like industrial archaeology and all of the other subsets that kind of would have been very tempting and easy to do. They made it about what archaeology can contribute to big scale changes and questions like the Reformation, industrialization, empire, etc. And um, we had an Iron Age panel uh, chaired by Fraser Hunter and Martin Carruthers. And it reminded me actually of um, probably the gold standard for conferences I've ever attended it was up in Orkney, the Scottish Iron Age Matters Conference, which we attended soon after. Um, we started this panel, um, and it was sponsored by a whiskey distillery and an ice cream manufacturer. Um, I've just never had a better discussion session in, in a conference. We also had a Roman panel, um, also chaired by Fraser and Martin. It was quite closely connected to the Iron Age, of course. Um, and if ever a panel lived up to the stereotype of what it covered, um, it was the Roman panel. Um, they kind of they completed their work with military efficiency. Um, they tackled some of the, the issues they had head on. They actually produced a table of key, um, key sites that had not been published, including by many of them, and then started leaning on people to get them done. And I've got kind of happy memories of uh, Professor Bill Hansen at the table asking questions like, but would someone with absolutely no knowledge of the period understand? Let's ask Jeff. Um, <laughs> I, I, li I like to think he had a twinkle in his eye as he did that. Uh, we had a Marina Maritime panel, chaired by Alex Hale, who's here, and Dan Atkinson. Um, and this was kind of mind-blowing to me, because like Doggerland was just you know, starting to kind of enter um, public consciousness. Um, and the huge potential of, um, of, of, of Marina Maritime archaeology. Um, also, at the SCARF launch, I actually introduced a now quite prominent um, underwater archaeologist to his future life partner. Um, which, like, how do you capture that in a project outcome? I tried. Um, and finally, we had a Science and Scottish Archaeology panel chaired by Karen Milek and uh, Richard Jones, which was a great group and had huge expertise. And it was really interesting to see how stuff has moved on since then, um, particularly things like genetics, how then it was all about technical questions of can we get a DNA, DNA um, you know, can we get around the contamination issue? And now it's actually moved much more onto um, ethical questions, you know, of how that data um, is employed. Also, um, that panel contained Richard Tipping, so I think contained is probably the wrong word when it comes to talking about Richard Tipping. Um, he was wanted by every single panel. Um, and I think that the version of SCARF that we completed in 2013, I think he wrote more of it than any other particular um, author. He was a complete, uh, um, like a complete workhorse. Um, and also, the, I need to say, um, thinking of Richard, the best proxy for human activity in the past um, is environmental data.
discuss, but that was drummed into me by, um, by him. The panels had broad chronological foci and were therefore at a very kind of strategic level. Um, and it's really cool to see much more of the, the regional and local story and the richness of that being brought out you know, in current SCARF. Um, the chronological approach made it much harder to involve the developer-led and applied side of archaeology, which I think was a, a, a definite weakness of that first stage of, of, of SCARF. Um, and I think the biggest challenge, looking back on it, that we faced was actually how to structure the information, how to structure those panel reports. It was way harder than I think um, I'd certainly anticipated. And I'd just like to pay tribute to the work. 800,000 plus words, plus a huge suite of additional material. And that was getting it down to 800,000 words. It was well, well over a million to begin with. Um, and I realize I owe the co-chairs in particular um, many, many beers. Uh, terms and conditions apply, not legally binding. Um, I realized that over this period in time, I had over 500 plus in-person meetings. Um, but I would completely have done another PhD after every single panel meeting. They were just, it was so inspiring. A scarf, as Simon was saying, was originally um, envisaged as a physical book, kind of ring binder, which actually part of me kind of like, kind of, part, of me, part of it appeals. Um, uh, and, and I need to um, emphasize the role that Emma O'Riordan played as um, SCARF officer and then laterally the um, SCARF project manager, um, heroically dragging us, kicking and screaming kind of into the um, internet uh, age. We soft launched in 2012 and then we full launched in 2013 at the Royal Society of, of Edinburgh. Um, and in order to have something to launch by the then cabinet secretary, uh, Fiona Hislop, uh, there she is, we created Telling Scotland's Story. There are a few copies here. Um, it was a kind of graphic novel style version of Scarf, translated into Gaelic as well and, and distributed all over the country. Um, I could, and I recently did actually at the University of Stirling, critically explore our approach in this. Um, it was very innovative at the time and had considerable impact. It led to a museum exhibition. In turn, it led to a musical collaboration. Even there were lots of press um, around it. We gave the writer James Crawford, um, who now to be seen quite regularly on TV as a, a presenter and author, and comic book impresario Shah Nazir, a freedom to kind of choose from a, a suite of stories. Um, but thinking about it now in particular, the stories we had for them to tell reflected research questions that we'd previously explored rather than ones that we'd maybe want to in the future. So there's definitely a bias you know, in that to men and men's roles. Um, and I, I certainly wouldn't reference the Indiana Jones like elements again, you know, it, it felt like that was maybe a kind of an easy trope and uh, to go for. Um, but there are some few copies here that Brendan kindly brought. So please do have a look and, and, and kind of tell me what you think. I think translation into Gaelic was particularly cool. Um, and that little step towards a different community was well received and reminded me that topics like language um, are key to consider, but are easy to miss. And actually, it's nice to see Kevin in the audience who flagged that up, particularly for an early version of the, the modern panel that you know, really needed to bring out the, the Gaelic side much more. Um, this is from the launch. We also still have one of these in the society kind of attic, um, ready for the unsuspecting to kind of open up. And I thought I'd put this slide in because it's done to universities and I realized it's still in our attic. So by putting this up and having it recorded, it will make me get that um, heed uh, back up to the University of Dundee. As the demographic question perhaps hints at, there's still a lot we don't know. Um, but there's amazing stuff happening in all corners of the discipline. And it, it's amazing for me to think back and go, wow, for a very brief period, I had a lot of that like, actually in my head. Um, but now, obviously, stuff has, has moved on so much. But luckily, there's a research framework that allows me to catch up um, when I need to. And I just wanted to finish with three key takeaways um, from my time kind of at SCARF and looking back you know, with the benefit of of a heck of a lot of years now. Um, the first is that process is as important as end product. SCARF was at times messy, but we brought people together and they did really cool stuff and they, they continue to do really cool stuff. Secondly is that partnership is the strength of Scottish archeology. span It's a genuinely unusual characteristic for the sector. Um, I know uh, you'll be hearing a lot more about the archeology span strategy uh, later on, which kind of reflects this. But it really is um, working with other sectors and kind of looking in. We've, we've got something really good in Scottish archaeology. Um, and thirdly, I think we must continue to improve how we tell the story, which oddly, I think, is very much how we come down. It comes down to how we structure um, information. And that can be something we can maybe pick up um, in discussion over a cup of tea. And for me personally, it was a dream job. I'll be forever grateful. Um, and I'm very happy to say happy birthday to Scarf. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Jeff. Okay, so next I'd like to introduce um, Diana Murray, um, who, as you've heard, was involved um, in the SCARF project from the beginning as a member of the steering group um, in her role as working for the Royal Commission um, at the time, RCAMS at the time. Um, so Diana's going to give us um, her reflections on, on working on the project um, as a member of the steering group um, and uh, some thoughts on the process. Thank you. Thank you and good morning, everybody. The problem with being third in the retrospective is that everyone said everything I was going to say already, so please forgive me if I, if I repeat stuff. I also don't have any slides because um, now being retired, I don't have the same access to slides that uh, I had before and, it's, uh, and I thought it would only be wallpaper anyway. So there's your wallpaper, unless you prefer the Ring of Brodgo, which... <laughs> um, so, right, some reflections on SCAR. <clears throat> I'm at the end of 2007, I was approached by the director of the Society of Antiquaries, Simon, to ascertain whether the commission, of which I was then the secretary, would be willing <coughs> to take part in the development of a Scottish archaeological research framework, or what it was later called, um, but also, of course, to provide funding and support in kind. I mean, you don't come uh, without, without the baggage. So obviously, I was very glad to lend my support, especially as the Commission was just entering its centenary year, celebrating 100 years of recording, surveying, and researching Scotland's archaeological and architectural landscape, and creating an inventory of sites and monuments, both through publication and online. <coughs> Taking part in such a major initiative as creating a Scottish archaeological research framework seemed to me to be a wholly appropriate and timely way of marking this recording milestone. Um, it would also give us pause to assess whether our own strategic work program was meeting the sector's needs. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so while documenting Scotland's archaeological monuments were still considered important, even essential, in 2008. The inventorization had slowed considerably, and it was far from complete coverage of Scotland envisaged by the first commissioners in 1908. The commission had abandoned the published inventories, had already embarked on other forms of more rapid and analytical survey. Much more information was now included, with detailed measured surveys, digital recording, photography, and many more sources to research. <coughs> New types of site were being recorded, recorded notably medieval and post-medieval rural settlements, which had been very much omitted from earlier surveys. And new types of sites were being revealed through aerial photography. By 2008, there were, of course, regional archaeologists who were creating records of their own. An increasing number of excavations, together with an increase in the number of those undertaking research in universities and museums, in fact, the amount going on was beginning to be overwhelming. Research was scattered in publications, periodicals, grey literature, and, most notably, in people's heads. A number of initiatives had already started, uh, for example, the Archaeology Data Service, aiming to uh, capture grey literature publications, and the attempts at integrated online databases, including SMRs and Canmore, but that still did not address the fact that a lot of work was isolated in individual research projects by individual researchers and connections between relevant studies were based on inside knowledge. So impressionistically, I think there was a feeling that there was a lot of knowledge out there, but information and intelligence about what sources were available and what was most relevant was really getting away from us. Um, uh, Simon mentioned the initiatives that were going on elsewhere, which we were aware of, um, but we were beginning to think we needed something ourselves. Planning a commission survey, research in university or museum or in historic Scotland, trying to prioritise which worthy projects to fund, there was no clear guide on what or where the present gaps in information or most rewarding opportunities were to be identified. So coming up with the idea of creating a research framework for Scotland was a, an initiative which I think a number of people, including myself, laid claim to. Um, <coughs> Simon's already mentioned uh, that he thought he laid claim to it, and uh, Roger obviously thought he did as well. 
we were aware of the research frameworks that had been developed in England and Wales, the latter I had a small involvement with, we asked ourselves whether we could develop something similar in Scotland, seizing that familiar opportunity that it was still possible to develop something at national level in Scotland. And we wanted to contrast that to the situation in England and Wales where the research frameworks were more local and each was created using their own set of criteria, meaning that it was very difficult to, take underta to undertake cross-geographical analysis. I remember having long conversations, probably over lunch as well, on the merits of building an archaeological research framework with Roger Mercer, formerly my boss at the Commission, and by then president of the Society, with Simon, our director, with Malcolm Cooper, then Chief Inspector of Historic Scotland, with a number of regional archaeologists and with staff of the National Museum and Edinburgh University. These were all casual conversations, <coughs> but uh, intense. Uh, and uh, as Simon said, kept coming back to this idea of a framework. So who thought of it first is anyone's guess. But the key thing is that we were all pushing as an open door. And we caught the moment when everyone saw the need for and the value of such an initiative and everyone was prepared to put their shoulders to the wheel to make it work. Critically, the society stepped up to host the initiative, which was a shrewd move. At a stroke, it neutralized any potential competition or bias. Historic Scotland stepped in with the bulk of the funding, initially for five years. Well, those were the days. Um, Historic Scotland could see the real value for themselves in having a framework that was created and owned by the sector on which they could base investment decisions. The potential was also obvious to other players as we all had future programs of work to plan for and being able to demonstrate that such a program would address a gap in knowledge and maximize the use of limited public funding, which was getting more and more pressured, is a powerful and a very valuable argument. As most of you know, I spent most of my career attempting to create an online resource, Canmore, that would open up information about the historic environment to everyone who needed it or wanted it. Using this resource, it is possible to see the areas where there are gaps in data and where data needs updating, but it's not comprehensive then or even now, and nor does it contain the analytical tools necessary to identify or document the state of research in any one area or significant gaps in our understanding of the past. It seems to me important that if we expend public finances on archaeological investigation and research, then we have a duty to target that money appropriately, as well as making the results widely available to other researchers and to the public. So as well as allowing us to target available funding to answer key questions, one of the elements built into the research framework from the start was honesty, openness, and accessibility. This premise has gone on to make the Scottish framework distinctive and most useful to seasoned, seasoned users, early researchers, historic environment managers, and the interested public alike. Uh, the first task in 2008 was to establish a steering group that would help to design and shape the program of work. And under the leadership of Roger Mercer, a group was brought together of those who would be the main beneficiaries of a research framework. Those I have already mentioned above, senior representatives of the Commission, Historic Scotland, the National Museum, Glasgow and Edinburgh Universities, and regional archaeologists. We knew that there were a large number of individuals working in Scottish archaeology who were expert in their field of study and who could also see the benefits of a research framework for themselves. The prodigious talent of the sector was harnessed into expert panels that uh, Jeff has described, um, producing a monumental voluntary effort to consolidate information on the state of archaeological knowledge. <coughs> Uh, the research results that were available and relevant and uh, sorry the research results that were available and relevant and highlighting those elusive gaps in our knowledge that would benefit from further investigation my impression was that the panel members relished the opportunity to come together to discuss their research interests and what they regarded was well understood and what would benefit from further work um, and again, this is to do with the 
the benefit of actually communicating with one another as much as the end product. A number of panels also offered up new approaches and most identified research and methodic methodological issues which certainly uh, have been taken up. The aim was not only to produce an analysis of the state of knowledge, but aspirational suggestions about what needed to be further investigated or could be individually researched or could be built into programs of work. And that aspirational nature of it was really important because it was so easy to get bogged down in, in the, the immediate and not into the long term. With focused panel membership plus the number of critical friends who were also harnessed to help, over 100 individuals gave of their time to set up the framework, which was completed on schedule in 2012. And this was a, a tremendous achievement in a relatively short space of time to have done something which had never been even tried before in Scotland. And it must have represented the involvement of a significant proportion of the archaeological community at the time. The scope of the framework could have been very wide, and there were a number of debates in the steering group about what should or should not be included. In the end, the steering group decided the panel should focus initially on chronological time periods, being the most relevant to the decision-making requirements of those investing in the project. We appointed a very talented project manager, Jeff Saunders, who galvanized the panels, helped with their administration, kept their discussions structured, with tight briefs and timelines and helped them to put the documentation together, wielding the whip uh, uh, with all the panels so that we actually did produce something that is coherent uh, and manageable uh, and produced on time. There always was an argument for additional panels to pursue potentially many different aspects of Scottish archeology. span Subsequently, some thematic groups did emerge and while keeping the work tightly controlled to ensure delivery, it was also understood that the remit must be flexible enough to allow further areas to be developed in time. More recently, I'm pleased to see that a number of further topics have been developed, including carved stones, as well as the development of regional frameworks that can focus more closely on particular geographical characteristics while still fitting into the national framework. The original plan was to produce a publication, as you've just heard. Thank God we didn't do that. Um, I was responsible for sorting out Roger Mercer's archive. He never did file anything. He would never have filed any of those pages that would have been in a lever arch file. So good intentions, but it was quite impractical. So um, the commission had the skills and were initially able to help in kind with the development of the website which allowed easy cross-referencing and linking. A website is, of course, much easier to update, and as a result, has become a very rich and interesting site, a go-to for research resource. But technology moves on, and what seemed dy dynamic 10 years ago may appear rather static today, and there are all sorts of ways that, you know, uh, wiki ways and googly type search ways that uh, that could be applied today that would make it a lot more usable. But it's a mark of its success and value that the society has been able to update and further develop it. Um, an ongoing commitment which we mu must not let drop. And it's not just a catalogue of what we know and don't know. It contains analysis and references and makes those links and connections that were so hard to do before. And if you don't remember before 2008, it really was quite hard to get at that information that is now so easy to, uh, to see uh, on the framework. Um, the, the review that was carried out in 2019, which I was reading last night, suggests that the framework is still serving the functions that it was originally intended to do. But of course, there are always ways to improve things, and this is probably your job now, um, and it is important that we keep on improving. The framework has been used to inform, for example, the archaeology strategy published by HES but contributed to by many in the sector. Um, the regional frameworks are clearly of value and there is momentum to continue to add themes to the framework which we shall hear about later today. Um, what I cannot judge 
really is what impression SCARF has actually made on the state of knowledge and the targeting of our research programs. Do we know more as a result of SCARF or do we just know more because we're doing more research? But my impression is that it is making a difference. And the need for SCARF seems as relevant today as it was 10 years, even 15 years ago. Um, the massive amount of information held there is a testament to the state of archaeological knowledge in Scotland, as well as the willingness to come together and share our research interests. So, happy birthday, Scar. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then the final speaker of this first session today is uh, Sally Foster um, from the University of Stirling, and she's going to be talking to us about the future thinking of carved stones in Scotland um, framework, um, which was sort of the next sort of, I suppose, framework to be incorporated into the SCARF project, although she's going to explain a bit more <laughs> about how all that came to be. Um, so um, over to Sally. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And um, yeah, we were the next framework to come into being. And I'm, uh, we're in the past section of, of SCARF, but I'd like to say we're actually very contemporary. And the key word is future in the title. And I'm hopefully going to demonstrate some of that, some of that relevance. So thank you very much for having me today to talk about um, our project. So it's my pleasure to tell you about what's transpired to be, I'm told, the most popular of the thematic scarves. And I think I'm, I risk being immodest, but I think our framework is also unique internationally, I believe, in terms of its approach to how we designed it to make a difference on the ground. And what I want to do is to give you some sense of, the, of its character and reveal some of the impact it's been having as a result of the approach we took and the importance of carved stones to past, present, and future societies. So here we are, we are the lead authors, um, sat in one of our workshops in, excuse me, in 2015. Many other people acted as critical friends, produced case studies, or contributed to the text. But I think I speak for all, our lead, all the lead authors when I say that producing this framework took us on significant and even career-defining intellectual journeys. So we come back to that process point. Working as a team, we rehearsed and found a common way to articulate what we know about carved stones, where the gaps are and why, and how, through future research, we can make a difference that matters to society as a whole. So Future Thinking was born when I was chair of the National Committee on Carved Stones in Scotland. And some, some people in this room are also uh, members of that committee or, and were on the committee at the time. As a committee, we identified a problem that we wanted to solve, which we articulated as general underappreciation of the significance of carved stones in Scotland and the threats to them. So we, we analyzed this and we came, we came to the, we, 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 we drew out that we saw our purpose then as being to promote an increased awareness of the interest and value of carved stones and improved handling of their needs for wider public benefit. So we, we, we identified we therefore had a purpose, we had an issue, therefore we had a purpose, and we identified as a committee uh, producing a research framework as the way to achieve this. The Universities of Stirling and Glasgow successfully obtained a Royal Society of Edinburgh workshop grant and led the project, so that was Catherine Forsyth and myself, and the National Committee on Carved Stones obtained funds from historic, well, it might, might have been Historic Scotland in those days, I forget now, <laughs> HS or HES, to support a public workshop as part of the framework design. And the Society of Antiquaries invited us to, oh, I realize I don't know how to move this cursor. Um, sorry. Um, I need to be able to read my text. Um, the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland invited us to offer our framework to the SCARF fold, which we did, but the direction was independent of them. So we had funding from, from various sources. We brought others in. We held a series of workshops involving, our profession, involving professionals and the wider public in how we formulated our approach and the questions to ask. And these had a particular, the workshops had a particular emphasis on the application of a digital and a scientific framework, but also the challenges and opportunities at ecclesiastical sites. A large event held in the Royal Society of Edinburgh was open to all with posters and discussions of themes uh, that were of interest to those attending. The lead authors, the four of us you just saw, then led on the writing, seeking contributions where we didn't have the sufficient expertise, and inviting peer review from as many people as we could. The light bulb moment arose when, uniquely for a research framework, we decided to structure the, the way forward around the so-called heritage cycle. This is a cycle that underpins much of Western um, values-based heritage practice. 
And it's predicated on the idea that if we understand the values of something, it could be anything, but we're talking about carved stones. If we understand the value of something, we can protect what's significant about it. The new stories we can construct will improve public engagement and enjoyment. And this will then whet the appetite for uh, everybody wanting to know more about things, more research. And this, in this way, new values emerge uh, that new values will emerge and can or should be acted on. And that cycle is reflected in our framework structure. Sorry. In our, in, our, in our framework structure. So if you look on the left-hand side of this slide, which is the earlier version of the, of the website where it's actually easier to see it, um, the current state of knowledge is described chronologically, so we did that kind of traditional thing, although we added a section on heritage research. But the next four sections address the gaps we have in relation to each part of the cycle, while the final section expresses a vision for the future of interdisciplinary research. So those stages were, so we've got the current state of knowledge, it's chronological, but then we go into creating knowledge and understanding, understanding value, securing for the future, and engaging and experiencing. And we look at the research that's necessary to achieve each of those for carved stones. There are then, there's bibliographies and supporting information, and then there's a really lovely rich body of case studies as well. So what therefore underpins our approach is that we understand the significance of something, the sum of its meanings and values. It's the tool for releasing the potential of carved stones and working in a joined up way, as, as we've all been talking about. And research on the core themes of understanding, valuing, caring and engaging, therefore function together to create an ongoing and deepening cycle of making a difference. And in doing this, we illustrated the benefits of thinking about biography, landscape and materiality, as other scholars have done. So we also think it's important and are excited by the way that carved stones offer a touchstone for wider attitudes to the historic environment and to heritage practice. And that's because they cross so many different boundaries. So we were doing something for carved stones, but we were also doing something that we felt had wider application. Okay, there's not the time to go into any, any more of that in detail today, you'll be glad to hear. But in adopting a values-based approach, we were making the case for researching and understanding the social value of carved stones, as well as those more traditional archeological, art historical, and historical um, issues. And on this screen here, you can see what social value is. We talk about social value. It's the significance of the historic environment to contemporary communities, including people's sense of identity, belonging, attachment, and place. So, the point is that we built people, people today, into the research that we wanted to do about carved stones. And what might not be widely appreciated is that work that's been done on carved stones in Scotland has been pioneering in making the case for why social value should be considered for the historic environment as a whole, not just carved stones. So uh, we were building on that in our, in our approach. So what I want to do for the remainder of the talk, and I do apologize for these text-heavy slides, I'm gonna introduce some of the ways we know that future thinking has been making a difference on the ground. So this is hard, it's, it's evidence. But my evidence predominantly relates to actions by academics, institutions working with heritage, third sector organizations, and community, community groups. Text heavy slides, I'll just, I'll, I'll just identify a few things. But I actually wanted to put this stuff up here because I hope, particularly people who are going back and looking at the recording, or I'm happy to share the slides, there's some really fantastic evidence emerging here for who's using the, the, the scarf and how it's, how it's being used. And I think that's really important to be able to, to see that. This is no more than the tip of the iceberg. And it is, I just emailed some people and they gave me some stuff back. So, you know, a proper evaluation would, would give us a much broader, broader picture indeed. So what, um, what emerges partly, um, and, I'm, and I obviously I've chosen how I'm going to frame these. Oh, yeah, and I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna draw out one, one particular quote here, which comes from Judith Anson of HES is changing its approach to significance assessment. I won't say that future thinking was the reason for this, was the sole reason for this, but it certainly helped because it shaped our thinking and approach. I particularly appreciated the valuing section, which has relevance across historic heritage asset collections, categories and serves as a very useful and sound and succinct way to approach considerations of value and competing values across heritage types and valuing communities. So actually, I'm gonna contradict something I said earlier, which is, or, or I'm going to add to, the, the, the process is really important, but what, I'm going to, what's, what I've learned from the, the messages I'm going to show you is actually the output has also been really useful. Lots of people are referring to the output and the approach that's in it. So that's a key point. Um, so we, we do risk overlooking that for those involved in developing research frameworks, that process is really critical. And I'm gonna use the example here of my own research very briefly that 
influenced by thinking about carved stones, Sean Jones and I developed a project on Iona. We did a particular piece of research. It led to some publications, for example, My Life is a Replica, and that then led to the co-design of guidance and principles for the heritage and museum sector. That would not have happened in that way if we hadn't been doing the thinking that went into the research framework. And those of us involved in creating the framework, we also use it in our teaching. It's thinking and it's, it's, it's thinking shapes the next generation of thinkers and practitioners. We see that in um, MSC, you know, dissertations and things that people produce as well. Um, but future thinking, it's also been used to shape various policies in Ireland and Northern Ireland and Scotland. And Simon, I'm really interested to hear what you said about the discovery program and thinking about research frameworks. We've learned that this, you know, it's a really good example of, um, so this is a particular area where further evaluation would be necessary, but it's, it, the output is having an impact in the way that people are actually developing policies. Um, it's being used to, by academics to support funding applications, including major projects, for example, Scotland's rock art project, a part of the Forestry Land Scotland. Um, as part of that project, Forestry Land Scotland produced a, a song in stone, which was specifically about helping to deliver one of the um, areas that we'd identified in, in, in future thinking. So it's helping people with their funding applications. Um, it's also, with its values-based approach to releasing significance of car stones, it's being used in Scotland and Ireland. This is just the evidence I have so far to inform casework, particularly the production of statements of significance for carved stones. And just to quote Judith Anderson, former senior cultural significance advisor at Historic Scotland, I recommend it as a guiding text to people within and outside of HES who were attempting uh, significance assessments or were trying to think around the principles of value and evaluation. So it's, it's been used not just in relation to carved stones, it's been used in much wider ways. And as she says very kindly, it's got very few competitors in this important field. Uh, it's also influencing the work of community groups and the consultants that work with them to train, advise, and help them co-design projects. And I'd flag up here the comment from Pauline Gleeson of the National Monument Service of, of Ireland when she says, I've also referred numerous other heritage groups concerned mainly about carved stones to the document, mainly on our commun community monument fund. It's often asked in terms of community projects, how do other jurisdictions deal with these issues? The archaeological profession here are not a, often not aware of the research on carved stones, so it's a good reference point for practitioners. Now, in terms of the way forward, I put up this very lengthy quote here from um, Thomas O'Carragoyne, but it's a really good example of where a major project, in this case in Ireland, has been shaped in a really major way by the sorts of approach that we've got in in, in, in the scarf, he ends up, I have no doubt, that researchers across these islands and beyond will continue to draw inspiration from future thinking in the years to come. So the output there does actually really matter. But our hope as lead authors uh, was certainly that the case studies would continue to be expanded um, and that ultimately, you know, the document um, would reflect those, those more kind of, you know, broader and more up-to-date um, uh, case studies. But given the originality, logic, and impact of our framework, um, we also want, that, that, that to me actually is one of the key things about this particular framework, that we've got a particular fro approach and it's got a particular logic. And I'm gonna contradict, I'm going to um, show some sympathy for Roger Mercer, who's <laughs> not had some, we, we actually, you can download from the National Committee on Carved Stones in Scotland's website, you can actually download a, a, a PDF of our full uh, research agenda. And this is really important because it's not something that you'd, you, you can just dip, dip into it, but actually if you want to understand the approach that we took, and it's the approach that's really original and I think is making the difference, you kind of need to look at it in a, in a read it um, properly. And I don't think you always get that from um, looking at the website, unfortunately. Um, and we did produce a, a limited edition li popular summary, but that, that's, that's no longer available to people apart from online, which I think is a, is a real shape, pity. So there's lots of ways in which going forward this um, research agenda can be revisited, but I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't do it too soon. I think what's important is the approach that's there. That approach is, is, is of value long term. We made some recommendations, but you know, other, other ideas will emerge and they're, they're just as valid. It doesn't matter that they're not actually mentioned in the research framework. The approach is, is what's really critical and that I hope 
in, in a way is going to be our legacy. But what we actually want is projects where people are doing work on carved stones. And I think it's, you know, we're seeing these great examples in Ireland where people are actually drawing on, on, the, on the scarf. And I'd like to see more explicit use of the scarf in major funded projects in Scotland, such as the wonderful Scrap Project. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'd like to invite any questions or even any thoughts on your reminiscences of being involved um, in the Scarf Project um, um, back, back in the day. So. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, Simon was being a bit modest. He was actually appointed well before April 2007 um, after an interview in a rather like Jeff's in rather unsuitable uh, accommodation um, in the society's rooms. It was either uh, too hot with the window closed or too cold with the window open. But Roger Mercer, Alice and Sheridan and I sat through rather a long day um, to make what in the end was a very obvious decision to appoint Simon. And uh, turns out, I think you'll agree to have been quite a uh, quite a good one, um, but having um, uh, having said that, I'd like to endorse one of the points Diana made, and in relation, I can be indiscreet because he's over there, to Noel Foyot, and I suspect probably also to Rod McCulloch, uh, who is perhaps not, is he here? Yeah. Yes, yes Rod, 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 who's here as well in that one of the big things about SCARF is that it was something that we were able to go to ministers and say, look, this is something somebody else has done. In effect, I mean, formally the society, in effect, the whole archaeological community. Instead of the usual thing ministers get is people coming to them and saying, please do this, that, or the next thing. And after the first meeting of the steering group, which I can remember nothing about, I was there purely ex officio, but what I can remember is when I was waiting for the bus on the way home, Noel walked past me on the way back to to uh, Longmore House from Bernard Terrace and explained this. He was really chuffed because he had got what he wanted. <laughs> and the amount of money involved, essentially Jeff's salary plus um, travel expenses, was on a, certainly on an annual basis uh, tiny in relation even to a body like Historic Scotland, and Rod would have been able to make it uh, disappear in the roundings, as the, uh, uh, the saying goes as these things. And eventually, of course, we were able to present the minister with something, with something tangible. Um, but I think that's, uh, that's a point that is worth... Um, uh, bearing in mind, given that uh, uh, a lot of things have changed in this relatively short time, and it's going to be even more difficult to get money out of public bodies to do useful things uh, like SCARF. So uh, apologies for, uh, for going on. Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. I just wanted to say thank you very much for the very kind words. Mm -hmm. Um, it was the only job interview I've ever had where I had to make tea for the panel. Um, <laughs> and there's another story that goes behind that as well, but I don't know if Dan wanted to say anything more about the... Any more thoughts or questions? Thank you. Um, Sally, you've, you've spoken very eloquently about the impact and use of your framework. And would any of the speakers like to say a little bit about the, um, the 2019 review and the impact and the use of SCARF as a whole? <laughs> probably Helen. Well, I'm, I'm going to say a bit more about that in the, probably the session just after lunch when we're looking to the future, because a lot of the um, part of the review then has informed what we're going to be or trying to be doing um, in the future. 
Um, so yeah, so we did, um, yeah, it was a very positive review in terms of um, people using it and the quality of information. Um, but obviously it brought up a lot of things that we all sort of know in a way in terms of it needs to be kept relevant, it needs to be kept more relevant. I think um, we spoke about the, the old website and there was an intention that it would be more iterative and it would be updatable and you know it would keep fresh and I think that, we, it, it, that didn't happen as well as well as could have happened. Um, so we do have sort of various plans for the future to try and make that work a lot better with our new website um, and particularly with linking to the way we're going to be talking about how um, archaeological work is reported and how that will come back to SCARF. So as work is done, we will automatically get to know about it and then be able to update SCARF itself. So, um, so yeah, I will be talking a wee bit more about that after lunch as well. So. Uh, it reminded me as well that though at one point we actively looked at putting SCARF on Wikipedia mm -hmm. rather than reintroducing yet another wiki-style um, uh, uh, platform. Um, just stick it all on Wikipedia, but I can't we decided against that in the end. I'm glad we did. Thank you. Um, I, I might be sort of a, a, a risk sort of I don't disagree, but I think we need to bear in mind that SCARF is not the last word in anything. It, SCARF has come together because people who gave a lot of free time, some people are employed, the majority of us gave our free, considerable amounts of free time to produce these documents. And they do not claim to be the final word in anything, but they, they set a tone, they set an approach. And something like the Carvestone one is very much about an approach to a resource that you could apply to anything, actually. We chose to apply it to carved stones. And it's having that knock-on effect. You know, we talk about principles, problems, practice, um, what, some ways in which existing projects could be enhanced. We do identify some new projects going forward. But we, we know this isn't the, the final word. And we do not want to cramp the style of other people who come up with really good ideas, absolute, just because it's not in SCARF. And I'm not sure that SCARF necessarily needs to be reduced. It, need, it needs to be, we need to be aware, you know, people are using it, you need to use it in an intelligent way. And I think there's, there is a question about where there is, for me, I think there's a question about where do we put our resources? Do we put our resources into more research that does some of the things we've talked about SCARF doing? Or, or is there a risk that we think SCARF is the answer to everything? I don't think SCARF is wonderful. I'm not, I'm not trying to be dis dissent, but it, it's not everything. There are things that go around. There are activities that need to take place in the sector that g contribute to the environment and then will feed their way in some due, you know, due, due means back into SCARF. But I don't think SCARF is everything that we do. We want to actually do some research. We want to see ideas and approaches that are in SCARF taken forward. And I think that's, that's something just to bear in mind. Sorry, I was a so, so, sorry, I didn't mean to be. <laughs> Um, and kind of, I suppose, building on that, just the sense of creative messiness that I think um, the sector is very good at, and it's kind of reflected a little bit in SCARF too, in that I think I remember after that first steering group meeting that Brendan was talking, uh, talking about that I attended, I don't know if that was the same one necessarily, but I remember um, Noel just saying the most important thing is that it, you have a version of it, that it gets done. So more than anything else, it's that it gets done. And actually, that is a, a handy thing in that there's something there for people to either build on or argue against and say, oh, hang on a minute, you've not thought about this. You know, this is really important because it's, you know, and it's not covered. So it was very much to provide a structure that people could, you know, knock around, build on, knock down and, 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 and kind of rebuild. Um, yeah, I think a number of people have said it, but it's, it was the process of doing it that... And if we go on doing those processes of getting people together to talk about the issues, which is, I think everybody's made that point, I think that is the way that we, we progress, progressing. I do like your, your framework. I think that's your... Yeah. Well, I, I, we are right about the process, but nobody in Ireland was, or very few people in Ireland were involved in our process. It's the fact that it's out there and it's an exemplar, it's a model, and that it fills a gap because nobody else has done it. Um, means that it's actually having impacts that perhaps I didn't appreciate until I sent around a few emails to a few people I, I knew and then a, a bit of it. So it's not, it's not a proper evaluation. I think when we come back to the discussion this afternoon about evaluation, who are we asking about what impacts we're having and how are we, what are we actually doing to make the stuff have an impact, which includes the approaches we've taken, not just the ideas that, you know, the, like do something with car stones or whatever. Um, it's actually, there's, there's more, the impact can be in the approach as well as in the, the, the detail of what's in a, in a document. Yeah. 
And I think we'll hear more about that as well with the talks about the regional research frameworks, because we obviously have the finished frameworks for a number of the regions, but there's lots of projects, sometimes small ones, sometimes bigger ones, that have come out of the process of creating the regional research framework. So additional funding has been achieved through projects and have been identified. Sort of the work Susan's been doing in the Highlands, a lot of sort of community projects, working with museums, uh, um, working with the HER databases, for instance, that have all sort of been tangential, you know, proactive things that have come out of the process of, of creating SCAR. Yeah, uh, I have two questions. One's more about the future, so I'll hold on that. Um, I just seem to remember a long time ago there was more of a discussion of, of possibly having a more interactive where people could upload their own photographs of monuments, etc. I think it was possibly with Canmore. There was a, a discussion, and, and I just wonder what, what's kind of happened with that. Uh, you can. <laughs> um, uh, even before I left in 2015, 2016, it was possible to upload photographs and ideas and put things in. I'm sure there are members of staff of Historic Environment Scotland here today who can, I think Peter's there. You, you'll probably, you'll, you'll be more up to date than me on what, what is now possible. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can upload photographs through my Canmore and they're, they're linked to the Canmore records, but they're not, there's no connection between those records and the SCARF uh, reports as such at present, but it's possible. Uh, to go back to Alison's question, I think the biggest outcome of the recommendation was getting core funding for SCARF from HES for another three years, was it? Four, well, four, four. years, so three and a half years left, but yes. Yeah. We couldn't work with Roger Mercer without quoting Churchill, and I think we've, where we've got to is actually, uh, and pick up on Sally's point, where we've got to, I think, is very much we've gone past the end of the beginning. We're now probably into the beginning of the next phase, but there's clearly a huge long way to go. And it was certainly clear when everyone set this up that it was going to be a pretty much a permanent dialogue, not an end product. Uh, and I'm just glad to see how it has survived all these years uh, when all, a lot of the original people have moved on to other jobs or in other places or other, other realms that were still actually engaged here with such, so much life uh, in the process and looking at new ways to give it even more life and, and more value. So congratulations. Hello, <coughs> um, this is definitely a, a reminiscence, um, but I think I was involved in some in the modern panel and the reason was that I was a master's student for Chris Dalgleish who was obviously leading it. So I was roped in to make notes or something and found myself in this hall full of very august people and I was so ignorant I didn't even know they were august. So they were obliged to, they were obliged to listen to my stultifyingly ill-informed opinion. Some things have never changed in that regard. But, so I think, I think I was actually the youngest named contributor to SCARF. I was 22, 23. So that was quite an amazing experience for me and because of that I feel a strong sense of ownership and connection to SCARF and I've encouraged my own PhD students now to reference SCARF and their conclusion and of course so excited to see what happens with it because it feels like it's been an important part of my career as well so I think one of the things I'd, I'd encourage everyone involved in SCARF in the future and regional research frameworks that obviously you want the most knowledgeable most um, experienced people involved in panels but it's very important to get undergrads early career people involved as well because they will be uh, taking forward those recommendations and if, if you get them involved they will have that sense of ownership. Um, but I will say um, everyone was always very polite in listening to my nonsense I must say. <laughs> I was never made to feel uh, unwelcome or, or patronised and I was very grateful for that. I didn't know that we had been regarded as such stellar individuals. Certainly didn't <laughs> feel like that. I mean the whole thing about Scottish archaeology is that it, it is important to listen to Everyone who's coming coming through the process, you'll you'll be stellar one day. <laughs> but I, I mean, I think I think we just don't feel like that. We didn't feel that we were, you know, um, in in. We may have had more senior positions, but I don't think any of us felt that we, you know, we were above the arguments of anybody else in um, in, in what whatever stage of your career you're at. So um, <laughs> that's something that was a revelation to me today. <laughs>